The Supreme Court is considering whether Kentucky's attorney general can defend a controversial state abortion law. The law bans a common procedure used in second trimester abortions. It's currently been blocked in the lower courts. Natalie Brand has the latest from the Supreme Court. Anti-abortion demonstrators rallied outside the Supreme Court Tuesday morning. We will abolish abortion. Inside, justices heard arguments about whether Kentucky's Republican Attorney General can appeal lower court rulings striking down a state abortion law even after his Democratic predecessor declined to appeal. What we as Kentuckians want is a fail-safe. A fail-safe that if a state official who enforces state law says, I'm not going to appeal any further. Kentucky's attorney general can come in for the Commonwealth and say, no, the Commonwealth wants to go farther. Under Kentucky law, the attorney general has the authority to decline to defend a statute. The Kentucky Supreme Court has held that. The justices are not considering the constitutionality of the law, leaving the lower court rulings in place. Instead, this case focuses on procedure. Both sides of the abortion issue are looking for any clues as to how far the new 6-3 conservative majority will go in revisiting the landmark Roe versus Wade decision. The justices are scheduled to hear arguments December 1st in a closely watched Mississippi case which bans most abortions after 15 weeks. An appeals court blocked enforcement of the law saying it's in conflict with Roe versus Wade. And the new Texas law, considered the strictest in the nation, could also come back before the high court. Natalie Brent, CBS News, the Supreme Court. For more on this, I want to bring in Kim Whaley. She is a professor of law at the University of Baltimore School of Law. Hi there, Kim. Good to see you. So this law has already had a complicated procedural background since it was first enacted in 2018. Explain the legal history behind it. So just like the Texas law that's been in the news a lot or similar to that, this looks like it's blatantly not constitutional under Roe versus Wade. That is, it bans a, a certain a typical abortion procedure, procedure prior to viability, and that's the dividing line under Roe versus Wade. Um, and so p uh, people challenged the law. The state defended the law, and the two defendants named, on the one hand, were the attorney general and the state's health secretary. Um, ultimately, only the health secretary stayed in the case. The attorney general dropped out, said, we'll just let the health secretary be the defendant. They lost in the lower courts because I think it violated Roe versus Wade. Then there was a shift in um, the uh, governor's office, and a Democrat came in, and they said once they lost in the the Sixth Circuit, or I mean the, the appellate court, they said, "Listen, we're just going to stop here. We're not going to continue to appeal this." Then we saw um, a new uh, attorney general come in, a Republican, who said, "Wait a minute, I don't like that the state of Kentucky is not defending this." up above the Circuit Court of Appeals. And so even though the, we've timed out technically, I want to now step in, now that I've been elected, and defend the law. So we really have a political procedural fight. Republicans versus Democrats shifting seats within of power within Kentucky. And frankly, the tug of war is over once again, uh, women's you know, uteruses and this right to abortion, but it's really a political fight. So let's dig into this a little bit more. Okay, so Kentucky's attorney general's office under its predecessor agreed to be bound by the final judgment of the case. So what grounds does the current state attorney general, Daniel Cameron, have in his request to revive a challenge to the law? He's saying, listen, I'm the new cop on the block. I'm in charge now. I was voted in. And even though the law was declared by the federal courts unconstitutional, um, and as in your clip, uh, oftentimes prosecutors, I mean, attorney generals basically a prosecutor, they can decide not to prosecute a case. They can decide not to appeal a case. Lots of cases aren't appealed higher than an appellate court. Um, but he said, listen, now that I'm in, I'm in the, in the mix here, I want to change uh, the position of Kentucky, and I want to go ahead and try to overturn this ruling and essentially uh, get a ruling by what we call an in-bank, a whole panel of an appellate court or the Supreme Court, allowing this unconstitutional law to, co to go forward. He's just saying, listen, now it's my turn. Uh, the voters voted me in, so I want to change course.
So, Kim, if justices side with the state's attorney general, what could happen next? Well, the, the opposing argument is, listen, everybody has to abide by timeliness and rules when it comes to courts. Nobody gets a special pass, even if you're a political uh, you know, affiliate or a politician here. And lots of times, cases just end up not being an appealed. Um, if the Supreme Court decides to allow this uh, Mr. Cameron to come in now and change course, even though the time for appeal has result as as expand uh, expired because it's actually been resolved against the abortion law. Um, then the argument is that people can wait in the wings and jump in at the eleventh hour if things don't turn out the way they like it and say, now I want to I want to take this appeal up. And I also just think it brings courts into the political battle mm -hmm. around abortion and potentially other issues around procedure where it's probably best if they just, in my view, sit back and say, listen, the rules of timeliness are the rules. But the justices his, here didn't like the notion that this abortion law was just going to be sort of left for dead by Kentucky in terms of defending what was a law that was signed into law by a Republican governor, albeit, as I said, probably an unconstitutional one. So more broadly then, Kim, what precedent could a ruling in favor of Attorney General Cameron set for other states where the governor and attorney general are of opposing parties? I think it means that elections are going to matter even more around uh, hot constitutional issues like abortion, that people are going to think, listen, regardless of what's happening in the courts, if I get into office, maybe I can jump in and change the ship. I mean, generally, you know, when I worked for the Justice Department and people shifted office and say, you know, a, a particular federal agency, you just swapped out the name of the new secretary. Mm. It was still the government, essentially, that was being sued. Here, it looks like the question is, okay, the government government is, is really the party that's in power. And I do think that that creates a lot of theoretical and potentially practical problems that we, in this moment, probably can't even predict if the court decides that this kind of, kind of boomeranging politically is going to fly, notwithstanding the otherwise established rules of jurisdiction. I mean, so many implications to come, it sounds like, potentially from this case. Kim Whaley, Kim, great to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elaine.